Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's great to be here and uh, talk a little bit about one of these projects that's been going on is one of the main projects in my lab, uh, which is this deep dive system, which we call a system for macroscopic science. And I'm gonna talk about it at a very high level, but please uh, feel free to drill in and questions, especially about what's going on technically under the hood. So deep dive was a system that we started a couple years back. And it looks like, at a high level, something that you would think a lot of machine learning people would be interested in, maybe, which is this idea that what we want to do is not write yet another framework that machine learning people can come in and write another algorithm in, but we're trying to sort of target slightly above that. So we're trying to find something that domain scientists can use. And in fact, in deep dive, you can't even write down an algorithm. So we're not even trying to you know, build another one of these frameworks that allows you to write a new solver. We're going to allow you to write something very high level, a high level specification, and we're going to put all of the strain and stress on the underlying system that we call deep dive. And so we say this sort of mantra about this is think about features, not algorithms. And there's a lot of optimization and other kinds of good stuff going on underneath the covers. And as I mentioned, you can't even write down an algorithm in our system. You really have to operate at this high level uh, way of doing things. So let me show you an application of deep dive and some of the, what we've been building in our lab with some of those collaborators who are not machine learning people, not optimization people, but are really domain scientists. So one of the first we built was a system called Paleo Deep Dive. So this is with a guy named Shannon Peters who is in geoscience. This is the kind of system that people are building on top of this. So here's what happened. They wanted to be able to create the world's best, highest quality fossil record. Okay? So the information about where fossils are found is buried in scientific literature. So what they were doing is they were basically manually sitting down, taking PDFs, and then putting them into a structured database. Okay? Now that structured database contains things like where did we find the fossil, when did we find it, uh, you know, what time period is it from, and actually it turns out that if you look at a fossil, an expert looks at a fossil, they don't know where it belongs in the tree of life. They have to actually infer that it goes in a particular place in the tree of life, which is sometimes called a subjective taxonomic opinion. And so they were doing this process effectively by hand. So what we wanted to do in, in Deep Dive was try and figure out a way for them to express all the knowledge they have about the domain and be able to pull all that information out of the text and basically automate this process. So text and figures and images come in and we're going to basically turn it into a gigantic statistical inference problem to try and predict the most likely database that's on the right hand side. Okay. Now our approach was extremely aggressive uh, in how we do this. Every character, word, part of speech, whether or not two things link together, is all put into a basically large, large factor model. These are all random variables that are correlated in interesting ways that are basically we're tricking the scientist into telling us. And then we now have a factor graph that contains billions of these random variables and is terabytes in size. And so most of our papers and most of our theory goes into figuring out how to process that before the heat death of the universe. That's really the bar we set for ourselves. It's a very high bar. Uh, we just want to make sure that it turns out an answer at some time. And that turns out to be quite difficult, actually. So this is the setup that we're going we're gonna to go in. Now, if you've seen some of these approaches in the past, maybe three, four, or five years ago, you would probably be reticent to actually use this. You say, well, maybe I'm going to build this system, uh, but the humans are really what I would want to be able to do this extraction, and the machine's going to have sometimes lower quality. What I'm going to contend somewhat controversial on the next slide is that eventually you actually want machines to do these low-level extraction tasks, not humans. I'm going to show you the first data that convinced us of this, and we've been basically building several systems, and I'll describe them, that sort of validate this point. So what we did, we took this database called PaleoDB that was constructed by a good friend of mine. Uh, he was across the street as a faculty member, so it was a, you know, a natural collaboration. It wasn't some deep-seated love of you know, dinosaurs or fossils. Uh, but he was running this database called PaleoDB, and they had spent basically two continuous person decades doing what I just told you, reading papers, typing it in. Over 13 years, 300 or so volunteers, they annotated about 50,000 documents. This was revolutionary for their corner of what they call macroscopic science. They put out about 200 papers over this time, and 17 of those went to nature and science. So this was, this was a big deal for them. So we decided, hey, we'll put a CS grad student on it. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, <laughs> and we created Paleo Deep Dive. Okay? It was machine created by a very good student, Sejong. Okay? So, when we fired up the machine, and this was a, I'm, I'm cutting to the good part, shall we say, it was, a, it was an arduous process. This was the first one of these we were building. We immediately downloaded all the documents we could find. So we found about 10x more documents uh, than, they had been an, than it had annotated, so about 500,000 documents. You may ask at this point, why only 10x? Why not 100x? Do they only care about 10x more documents? Uh, no, it turns out, you know, the rough answer I'll give you is that publishers are criminals. 
Uh, so it turns out we've been fighting with publishers for several years. There's a lot more documents that we want to read. There's no technological barrier to reading them. We simply just can't get access to them for legal reasons. And I can tell you offline about all the hassles with lawyers uh, that we've been going through for this. Putting my rant aside and my pain and scars that I'm surfacing aside from that, in that 10x more documents, we got roughly 100-fold more extractions. Those are those tuples that we're after that they wanted to be able to create. Now, you may wonder, why are we getting an order of magnitude more data out of effectively you know, only 10 times uh, more documents, two orders of magnitude? Well, the reason is that people are very lazy. And this gets back to my point before of why you want machines to do this instead of people. When people read through documents, they eventually give up. They, get, they read the good parts, whatever they decide the good parts are. We looked through this for years, by the way, two years. I'm being glib about it, but this was an arduous process. They give up. They annotate some sections, but not others. They annotate about some animals and you know, critters and not others. And it's very inconsistent. And so just by being consistent and systematic, we're able to pull out a lot more information. Now the next question you may ask is, well, how high quality is the data that you're pulling out? Certainly the people are better at pulling this out than machines. So the first thing we asked was actually, well, how good are people? And this is where Porsa had the cry tears of blood. And he had to actually go through the database that they had created, take the information, and route it to experts. So basically, we begged, borrow, and stole expert time to look at the tuples that were put in this database by volunteers. And we asked for the first thing. We, we did this for a bunch of predicates. But we asked, can you place this fossil in the right formation? So you read an article. You look, at it, you look at it, it says it's in this formation, and you put that inside the database. How accurate are volunteers at, at doing this task? Well, it turns out they're accurate about 84% of the time. Now, you may wonder, what goes on in that other 16%? Is it typos? Is it something like this? That's a couple of percentage points. Actually, one of the biggest sources of errors, and these are these insidious errors, are that people read a piece of information, they have some background knowledge, and they say, oh, that formation is no longer called by that name. That's actually not the critter they thought it was. I'm going to call it by some other name and put that information in the database. When they're right, that's great. Your database improves. When they're wrong, that's sort of lost to the ages. And that happens a fair amount of time, especially as things like temporal intervals and formations actually change names. Okay. So now our machine makes systematic errors. That sounds bad at first, but I argue it's quite good. Because systematic errors means that you can fix them up over time. So we can go in, we can retrain the machine and be able to fix up the mistakes it's making, make a use of a consistent ontology across the entire data set. So not surprisingly, our precision is actually higher. And when we evaluated this, and it's in a paper that we posted a while back, it's higher across the board. So for every extraction, we get no worse quality than the human volunteers. And on three of the six predicates we detail, did a detailed evaluation on, we were statistically significantly better, but never worse. Okay? We had a higher score on each one. So this is why I would argue that you actually want machines to do this. They're systematic. It's really boring work. It has to do a lot of natural language processing. And yeah, it's a complicated process. But if you've been paying attention to that area recently, it's sort of hit an inflection point. And we can now build systems like this, complicated, big uh, extraction systems, pretty reliably. Okay. So as I mentioned, not too interested in dinosaurs. They're kind of cool, but you know, there's other stuff in life. Uh, we've been working with a bunch of labs at Stanford, uh, Russ Altman's lab in drug repurposing. We have a great student who's working on uh, extracting information from that. Uh, we've just started a major project in genomics uh, with some DARPA support and Gil Bejarano, who's in CS and pediatrics. Um, but let me tell you about one other place where you would probably never suspect to apply this kind of tech. Okay? So it's also used by a number of companies. Uh, and it's been featured in the media for what I'm going to tell you about in the next slide. Okay? So with DARPA, we started this, uh, we were part of this project called Memex. We were one of the people in Memex. And if you Google for Memex, you can see all kinds of scary, terrifying press about it. Uh, what DARPA decided to do was to crawl sex ads. Maybe at first glance, this doesn't seem like the best use of your taxpayer dollars to go and crawl a bunch of sex ads, but there's a legitimate reason to do so. The reason that they were doing this is they're trying to identify people who are trafficked, okay? So human trafficking, people who are forced into prostitution. And the basic hypothesis is that people who sell other people are bad, right? So you don't typically engage in this kind of behavior unless you're a pretty bad human being, and we should be able to track you down, okay? Not too much of a stretch. So what goes on here is there's a bunch of teams that crawl both the open and the dark web. And I'll spare you the open and the dark web part. This is things like Tor and the rest. Then this brings a bunch of ad style text that comes back. That's about basically service providers. These are prostitutes. This goes through deep dive. And we extract a, a huge amount of structured information, phone number, uh, rates of service, um, you know, locations. Uh, these are you know, the type of service with the idea that people who engage in riskier services or systematically underprice themselves are likely to be trafficked. This is the hypothesis. 
But this information was opaque before. This is another situation where people were curating this data, and basically law enforcement was, you know, is, is continues to be simply overwhelmed by it. So phone, number, phone numbers are quite uh, easy. They're a little more tricky than you think because people actually take countermeasures when they, when they put the phone numbers. So they'll do things like say 818 or they'll draw little figures or they'll put it in an image. There are several ways that people are trying to evade sort of text search for law enforcement. Phone numbers are very easy. I'll show quality on the next slide. Things like rates of service and what service someone's providing. So, so service providers will say things like, for a, I'll do this for a half hour for this amount of money. This will cost you this much for an hour. A girlfriend experience for two hours costs this. And they have this whole folksonomy about what they're actually extracting. So that's why it's difficult, because these are ambiguous, low quality text. And so we have to do sort of full NLP to get out things like rates and also locations. People very informally refer to locations, and we want to map them to metropolitan statistical areas, like the, what the census returns to us for various law enforcement purposes. Phone numbers, I should say, you know, even though they're not hard for the system that we built, we built them actually in a week. Uh, there was a previous team that had been working on this for two years and wasn't able to deal with some of those adversarial issues around phone numbers. So I don't want to downplay how hard that is. Okay. All right. So let me just show you the rough quality of these kinds of things. So this is something we built in about in over six months. Actually, the first version was done in about three months. Uh, the precision numbers are here. So things like price are, are actually pretty challenging to extract, what service is being provided, whether or not something is an ad for sex or massage or something like this. Uh, the location, the statistical area is something that we're doing, resolving that. You see these are quality in the 90s. Okay? Uh, name, the name of the provider. Phone number you see is extremely easy. This is the easiest one of all of them. So you know, pretty close to 100% precision and recall. Uh, and then requirement, which I will spare you. Anyway, so um, anyway, getting through this information, this were basically an interaction with various law enforcement partners that they said, we want to do a particular analysis. Let's crank up these values. And one interesting thing is that these are higher than the quality they were getting from human annotators. And at some point, they simply don't care. Even though we're making errors, we feel like we could do a better job. We simply stop improving it and move on to adding another attribute uh, to the table. And as I mentioned, we're very proud of this. Um, not only do, is this actually getting used, um, the broader Memex project, the New York DA announced that they've used it for uh, all of their human trafficking prosecutions this year and will continue to do so. So it's having some real world impact and hopefully putting some of those awful people we talked about um, you know, behind bars or at least finding out their networks. There are hundreds of arrests based on the Memex project, which is quite satisfying. Okay. okay. So uh, transitioning a little bit to technical stuff and maybe getting closer to the deep learning part that we talked about, one of the things we observed in this project and uh, through a whole bunch of different enterprise projects was this idea that basically there are these composite documents that are out there. Increasingly, you have text and some amount of images. We won't, I'll spare you the images from the sex trafficking and labor trafficking ones. Those are very depressing images. But even things like a company has text about an insurance claim, and they have pictures of the insurance claim. It's very easy to take photos these days and even record little bits of video. So, I'll spare you this slide, but basically what we wanted to do was extend deep dive to have some amount of image processing uh, without specifying an algorithm. So still keeping this very high level vision of being able to just have the scientists write down features of their particular uh, application and then be able to stitch it all together in some kind of nice way. Uh, and as Margot generously mentioned, we actually build some of these engines that do this kind of stuff, this image processing, and I'll briefly highlight one of those. But just to give you a sense of how these are useful, here's a scientific application that I hope is not totally depressing. So we want to recognize different little critters. Okay? So we, show, we get these pictures shown to us of like you know, taxonomic things. This is, a, this is a sponge. This is a brachiopod. This is whatever it is. And we want to be able to recognize those images, those fossil images. So when someone takes a picture, we can actually accurately place this fossil somewhere in the tree of life. This requires a human expert right now, and is, is thought to be more of an art almost than a science. There's a lot of training that goes into this. And actually, taxonomists are sort of dying off. It's a job that not many people want to go through all the training for. So this was highlighted by our collaborators. So we have this reading machine. We could label all these images and go through a similar process. We could do something that I think is quite cool. We could read the documents and then heuristically label images. Now, this would be quite noisy. When we read the document, we may label something as a sponge or a brachiopod sort of accidentally because we got confused by the text, because we don't actually understand the image. But then we're going to use this technique called distance supervision to try and learn a model that is a visual model, even in spite of all that noise. Okay? And so if you're sort of a mathematically minded person, we're going to have to add in a bunch of L1 penalties to do some sparsity stuff on top of the deep learning. Okay. So how does this work? 
it's kind of remarkable this stuff actually works. So we do the extraction, we provide the labels, and then we train a very standard imaging process, uh, which is a CNN, convolutional neural net. And here's just a sample. This is like a SQL query on top of Deep Dive right now uh, to execute, just a simple query. And you get accuracy in the 90s. Okay. Kind of remarkable how these tech can work when you actually start to combine them. And the reason I highlight this is that what's really exciting to me, and I think what ICME is well, very well positioned for, is that a lot of the data analysis problems are moving from these sort of narrow sort of verticals, like we're going to do some imaging, we're going to do some text, but how do we actually fuse that all together? And I didn't highlight it here, but basically everything under the covers is optimization. And that's really what we write most of our papers about. We like to build these applications because I like to build applications, but uh, underneath the covers, that's really what most of our science is about. So I'll skip plugging this. We have our own version of doing these uh, things that can use CPUs and GPUs. Not that important, just so I can wrap up. And what I want to conclude with is basically this idea that the next generation of these data processing systems are going to be increasingly integrative. They're going to take text, image, sound, sensor readings, and put them together. And that's really an optimization problem when you look at it. We know how to write down the right equations. We actually do. They're not that difficult to write down. Processing them is extremely, extremely difficult and is what we spend most of our time doing. Everything we do or we're allowed to put online is put online uh, at either one of these URLs. If you're curious about anything, definitely follow up with me. Unfortunately, I have a meeting immediately after this and won't be able to attend the reception. But please follow up and thank you so much for your time and attention. We both have time for some questions. So, you know, if you have a question, go for it. Uh, so technical documents, there's a couple of senses you mean that. So we've done everything here over the scientific literature, which one could consider technical documents, right? So we've done things with genomics and, you know, patent data. That's another one that's very popular, especially with companies. They like to use it for patent data, which are, again, technical documents. So scientific and technical. There, is, there are some projects that we're aware of that are starting up for sensing kinds of applications, sensor-based applications, where people are really reading manuals uh, to try and understand like operating regimes for various devices. Those are just getting off the ground. Uh, we're very excited about them, but we have no data on them. But it seems like a very interesting area to fuse your knowledge of how a system should be working with the actual sensor readings that you're observing. And that's, that's definitely a future direction. We, we just don't have any progress there yet. Great question. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, Margo. Yeah, appreciate it.